to uh, talk to us today and everyone who had uh, uh, honored us by joining to attend the conversation. Uh, welcome to the high level policy session number three on ICT information communication technologies applications and services of the WISIS Forum of 2020. Uh, my name is Mina Hanna. I am the co-chair of the policy committee of the IEEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems, uh, IEEE's Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, um, the largest professional member organization in the world, and one of the largest standards uh, making bodies. Um, I'm not going to talk to you a whole lot today because I have, uh, we are joined by an esteemed uh, and a fantastic, on our platform today, we are joined by a fantastic lineup of panelists, very diverse, very geographically distributed, really um, um, just, just uh, representing every side of, of our, of, of, of all, all, all sectors that are working in technology. So technology sectors are represented in governments and civil societies. So, you know, obviously my greatest thanks today for uh, the WISIS forum for uh, giving every one of us and all the panelists this platform to share their thoughts on a topic of that, you know, of such importance. Uh, my greatest thanks for all the panelists who honored us to be here and for the opportunity to host you all today uh, by being the, the high level track facilitator. Uh, a couple of things that I would like to mention, uh, we are going to, you know, I'm going to minimize the amount of time that I'm really talking today. You're not here to listen to me, but you're really here to listen to all of our fantastic speakers. Um, just for you to know that we have nine speakers. Um, we will have about 10, maybe 15 minutes if we are, um, um, you know, if that's, that's the, probably the maximum amount of time that we will have at the end for Q&As. So please feel free to submit your Q&As in Zoom. We're going to, um, if you wish to direct them to a specific speaker, please do mention so. Or if you'd like to have that question to be answered by any of the speakers that we have on board, uh, please also let us know that. Uh, there is a link that was posted, I think, on the page of the panel for um, 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 you know, if you're human captioning, uh, you will see it at the bottom. You can follow the link and, and go there from the same page where you can access uh, the panel uh, to stream the video. So without really further ado, um, you know, of course, let me go ahead and introduce you to our speakers this morning or this afternoon if you're not living on the Western Hemisphere. Uh, first of all, I am uh, uh, joined by Ms. Sylvia Paul Ahrens. She is the head of Digital Society Division of ITU, uh, the International mm -hmm. Communication Union. Uh, second, Her Excellency uh, Ms. Azza Ismaili, Minister of Technology and Communications of the Sultanate of Oman. Uh, His Excellency Dr. Ishat Saiber, Minister of Telecommunications and Information Technology of the State of Palestine. His Excellency Mr. Iyad Al Khatib, Minister of Communication and Technology of the Syrian Arab Republic. Her Excellency Ms. Pamela Gidi, Vice Minister of and Under Secretariat of Telecommunications of Chile. His Excellency Mr. Maxim Parshin, Deputy Minister of Digital, Digital Development, Communications, and Mass Media of the Russian Federation, and Mr. Ricardo Mina, Director at, at Entrum of the NDRR, Dr. Micah Lucan, uh, Past President of IEEE Canada, uh, Dr. Kwaku Ofosu Adarakwa, Managing Director of 25th Century Technology Limited of Ghana, and finally, last but not least, Ms. Asma Brini, representing um, Woman Vi uh this morning or this afternoon without really further ado let us kick it off uh to listen from our fantastic panelists so i will turn the microphone uh to miss sylvia paul Arons. floor is yours um sylvia thank you very much thank you very much mina and it's a great pleasure uh, on behalf of the bdt director to mr ring bokman to be here uh, and also to be amongst these great panelists and i will just try to give so, remarks to set the stage uh, and also relate a bit the work that we're doing in the development bureau uh, specifically in the division that that i'm head of and so that you can see uh, the type of work that we're doing so uh, the it the telecommunications development bureau has recently created a new digital society division which recognized the need to support countries seeking to achieve the sustainable development goals in the next 10 years. 
in their transition to the digital societies by harnessing digital technologies to modernize how governments deliver services and solve public problems. The digital service and applications thematic priority, which is part of this digital society division and in line with the WISIS Action Line C7, aims at leveraging digital services and applications to change and transform citizens' experience and the way governments transform themselves and the, and the way they do business to improve how to operate, how to deliver services, and how to provide impactful citizen-centric solutions in a way that, we, that will lead to concrete improvements in their quality of life and well-being and the attainment of the SDGs. To achieve that, a change in mindset is needed, away from a fragmented, duplicated, piecemeal approach of operating in silos and creating one-off digital solutions. Despite significant investments in the use of digital for SDGs, we have not seen ubiquitous scaled impact of digital services. Maximizing the leverage that digital technologies can have on a global development requires governments and their partners to take new holistic and integrated approaches for digital investment for SDGs. Government-wide or whole of government approaches to investing in shared digital infrastructure can lead to a more rapid scaling up of development services with strong focus on comprehensive citizen needs at a fraction of the cost and a greater return on investment taking advantage of economies of scale that are not available when delivering digital services in a piecemeal fashion. The digital service and applications program in line again with the WISIS Action Line C7 assists countries in developing government or sector-wide health, agriculture, agriculture, learning, uh, et cetera, digital transformation strategies and blueprints. It focuses on supporting countries to implement those strategies and deploy a portfolio of integrated high priority digital services, particularly in remote and rural areas, leveraging and developing as possible digital public goods. This is achieved by bundling broadband connectivity on one side with a minimum set of core and transformational user-centric digital service that address, for example, primary healthcare, food security, learning, women and girls empowerment, jobs, digital skills, financial service, but that can work and be scaled as a whole. One example is the smart villages in Niger. And this is a project that it has been led in, in, in this division as a whole of government and whole of society approach for rural digital transformation. I invite you to look at the website of Smart Villages and the work that we're doing there. The program is working closely with a number of lead UN agencies such as WHO, FAO, UNDP, UNESCO, and others to create a platform for sharing and reusing resources and delivering together as a one to leave no one behind. The ITU BDT Digital Service and Application Program is continuing to achieve the above by assisting countries to develop digital governments and sectoral transformational strategies and blueprints. And one of these blueprints is the one recently launched uh, by the Smart Villages project. At the systematic level to use ICT to re-engineer processes to improve efficiency, usability, and cost effectiveness. Deploy high priority uh, portfolio of comprehensive and integrated citizen user centric solution by deploying integrated digital trans platforms and services that leverage common digital services, building blocks and digital public groups, particularly in remote and rural areas. And finally, we work on sharing knowledge and building capacities related to the use of ICT for SDGs through sharing studies and research awareness raising, connecting stakeholders and addressing emergency technology trend, trends such as big data, artificial intelligence and blockchain. So thank you very much and I hope I have been able to set the stage for this session. Thank you very much, Sylvia. That was fantastic. Really appreciate your contribution. Let me turn it to Her Excellency Ms. Azza Al-Ismaili, uh, Minister of Technology and Communication of Sultanate of Oman. Uh, and let me ask you, Your Excellency, um, I'm interested to learn your thoughts uh, about in, in modern societies, innovation new technologies are key 
to growth and development. Can you uh, help us by highlighting one, prom one prominent project using the new technology trends and achieving more social and economic inclusivity? Thank you, Mina, and a very warm good evening or good morning, wherever you are to everyone. Oman? is adopting the new innovation trends in some of our new citizen business centric services. In the beginning of this year, we have established a center for the fourth industrial revolution, which aims to provide a robust environment that is supportive for research as well as development in the fourth IR technologies. In addition, and during the COVID-19 pandemic, a national committee headed by Ministry of Technology and Communications has been created. So to aid all ICT AI projects, which in turn would support the government's work against COVID-19. The committee worked very closely with the Ministry of Health to develop an integrated platform called Tarasud, which translates into follow-up in Arabic to enhance the ministry monitoring system. The system works through diagnosing, following up, and tracking the medical conditions of infected individuals under quarantine through the use of AI and other advanced technologies. The platform consists of two main systems, the medical test program and the registration and follow-up system, which work to check the individual's condition on a daily basis. It also monitors the spread of the pandemic and set priorities by using AI to minimize the intervention of medical personnel in early quarantine stages. The system monitors primary infection indicators by spotting the cases which require immediate medical care and directing them to medical institutions. Hence, it supports the overall medical system by minimizing and scheduling visits to medical institutions focusing only on the cases that need a medical examination. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, I, will, I will then turn it to His Excellency, Dr. Ashat Saida, Minister uh, of Telecommunication and Information Technology of the State of Palestine. Uh, Your Excellency, can you tell us your thoughts on the limitations on telecommunication technologies available in Palestine today? Dr. Ishaq, you are on mute as I Thank as you I very you. much. Oh, and I, uh, I uh, would like to, to say good afternoon for everybody. And uh, about uh, the limitation in telecommunication technologies in Palestine. In Palestine, 5 million people are only allowed a small part of the mobile spectrum and most of the countries are only covered with the GSM service and no mobile data. Other parts have 3, 3G, which was allowed to be deployed just two years ago. We have uh, followed all the uh, procedures needed and uh, the uh, bilateral agreement which uh, states that our uh, requirements of spectrum should be fulfilled in a period not exceeding one month. Uh, this didn't happen even once since 1995. We face difficulties in, uh, in entering equipment and sometimes to, uh, it takes years to, to be allowed also there is a huge uh, penetration of Israeli uh, operators in Palestinian market, around the 20%. Our only hope is through the international community. And uh, our, we and our companies are facing uh, limitation in, uh, in connecting uh, the uh, Palestinian cities because uh, you have to, to pass through the uh, area C uh, which is uh, controlled fully by the Israeli uh, militaries. And uh, 
every time when we are going to 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 improve our uh, our network our uh, technologies we face every time problems because uh, some some regions in palestine in palestine are not covered by the uh, the telecommunication technology so we hope that uh, yeah you will support us in in our uh, in our uh, hopes so that we could uh, implement the sdgs the, the sdgs uh, uh, purposes uh, freely thank you very much well thank you your excellency very much for your intervention um i will then ask uh his excellency mr iyad al-khatib minister of communication and technology of the syrian arab republic um uh, Your Excellency, what are the strategies and policies of your country to leverage the power of information, communication, te and te technologies in achieving the SDGs, and what are the obstacles you encounter to implement them? Mr. Ian. Sir, you are muted. Could you please unmute yourself? Yes, you yes. To... Yes, yes, sorry for that. First of all, I'm so glad. You hear me? You hear me? Did you hear yes, me? Yes, hear you clearly. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I'm glad to join you in Versus 2020 as a representative of the Syrian Arab Republic. And thank you very much to, join, to make me to join this uh, table round for discussing about ICT application and services. We all believe that the information and communications technologies essential of the achievement of the UN 2030, 2030 agenda for sustainable dev development in order to promote economic growth, social inclusion and environment sustainability. In addition to that, we know that connectivity produce productivity and people everywhere can reach the benefit of connectivity. As you, you know, the ego e-government and digital transformation are still in the core of our project in the Ministry of Communication and, Techno and uh, Technology in Syrian Arab Republic. As we know, the face we are facing a destroyed war from 2011 till now against terrorism, which, which destroy our uh, backbone networks. And the financial capabilities are limited due to the seasonal law. Despite that, the internet and mobile network in, uh, in Syria doesn't stop. I thank God for that. Uh, we are working with our destroyed network, especially between provinces, and we have a plan to develop a rural area and the region which destroyed the terrorism and war. We are trying to, to use the new technologies in repair the network by using fiber optic technologies to guarantee high-speed internet and e-government services and using IMS switches to and fix LTE-based IP and voice over IP in the rural, rural and destroyed area. In addition to that, we are trying to reach, reach the underserved population in order to create a sustainable economic growth via mobile facilities like applications and service, services related. Uh, another uh, item uh, we put in our plan for broadband strategy until 2030 to the rural area and poor villages to remain the sustained development. We also focus in our project on ICT in health and education, and we support the national university with advanced laboratories and technologies. Moreover, we establish, establish IQ training center in the university to motivate, <coughs> excuse me, to motivate the students, males and females, in order to put, put, uh, boost up the creativity and the innovation in society after graduate. Of course, without uh, forgetting the importance of, of the cyber security and e-government and e-payment, which launched from a few months previously and for environment, environmental sub sustainability. Also founded in Syria, the General Organization for Remote Sensing dedicated to achieve the UN goals related to the environment. Regarding the social, inc social inclusion, we aim uh, at uh, ICT 
best, more inclusive society for all. By make opportunity to more people to get engaged, giving women and girls for accessing ICT. In spite of the war that uh, disrupted most of uh, disrupted most of the infrastructure of and uh, communication in Syria, and despite that, the bad economic situation resulted from this war that lasted 10 years, our country continue our progress, pro progress in the project of ICT. However, the sanction on Syria impeded us to development and recon reconstruction. Nevertheless, with, that, with determination and preserve uh, our camp with a new solution and continue. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Your Excellency for your intervention. I uh, really appreciate your, uh, your contribution and being here on the panel with us. Uh, let me turn it to Her Excellency Ms. Pamela Giri. She is the Vice Minister and Under Secretary of Telecommunications of Chile. Uh, Ms. Giri, let me ask you, how is Chile in terms of information communication technology applications? Uh, which are the industries that have made the most progress on this subject from your uh, vantage point, from your perspective? Good day to all of you. Thank you for the invitation. And let me say hi to all the participants as well. Answering your question, in Chile, we have a consolidated telecommunications industry. We are a country of 17 million people, and we have 53 million services, which translates in almost three services per person. In this line, the massive use of data is a, re is a reality in the country, and so so today's statistics indicate showing the consumption grows and grows exponentially, especially in this time of pandemic, um, where it grew, it grew in three or four months, like 40%. Therefore, the application of, uh, of ICT is very is understood and spread and widely spread and used in the market. The development in, of ICT in Chile has placed the country in a leadership position in the Latin American region. In this line, the ITU annual report um, called Measuring the Information Society um, of 2017 puts Chile in a position 56 globally and seven regionally on the ranking corresponding to ICT de Development Index. Uh, numbers today are projected to go higher this performance is due to the collaborative and coordinated work between the public and private sector and also the academia to promote, promote digital ecosystem with education, um, etc. In this way, for instance, various industries in the country have registered important advances in ICT applications such as retail, mining, health, and agriculture. It, nevertheless, ICT obviously represents a challenge for all the actors in the telecommunications sector who have had and will have to increase the high speed the networks over the time to allow more availability and resilience above. All considering that in Chile, we are very close to start the tender for the deployment of 5G uh, that will re re make a revolution in the ICT market for this, um, for this reason, we uh, have a, a, a map that will be cast to, to, so making sure that all the ecosystem creates an invest and the uh, innovation and development to take advantage of this new 5G technology. And we have a plan, of course, also to make sure that everyone benefits from digitalization because still, as a, we still have a, with a, even though mobile phones, smart mobile phones, the internet mobile are well spread, still we have some areas of the country where fixed internet is not there. So we are working with um, big, the biggest um, subsidies in the history of Chile to make sure we close the digital gap and all the regions of Chile can benefit from the new technology and fixed internet. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Your Excellency. I uh, appreciate your intervention. Uh, I will then turn to His Excellency, Mr. Maxim 
Parshin, uh, he's the Deputy Minister of Digital Development, Communications, and Mass Media of the Russian Federation. Your Excellency, uh, let me ask you a point of question. Um, which ICT applications and services are used in Russia, and what is your vision of their development? Uh, <clears throat> dear Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for, honor for me to speak at the World Summit uh, on the Information Society which uh, this year celebrates its 15th uh, anniversary. Along with other members of the global community, Russia acknowledges the key role of digital technologies as a catalyst for economic development and social growth, as a driver for achieving su uh, sustainable development goals across all sectors of economy. Uh, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that at present, and digitalization has taken over the whole of Russia, including its most remote areas. Today, even in the far north, in Yakutia, there is an IT park covering around 20,000 square meters. Russian IT industry features uh, over uh, 45,000 companies. We are proud of having one of the most advanced educational and scientific schools uh, in the field of IT. Our talents uh, are highly demanded, specialists uh, hunted by such digital giants as uh, Google, Huawei, and uh, Apple. Over the uh, last five years, Russian software export ha has doubled. Game development is the area uh, that uh, has seen remarkable progress. It is um, expected that in uh, 2020, Russian uh, game studios export earnings will exceed 4 billion US dollars. Uh, the Russian uh, search engine Yandex ranks top five in the world, while last year social network UK ranks uh, the top ranks the top 20 of most visited website worldwide. Moreover, today almost all countries use antivirus protection developed by Kaspersky Laboratory. Russian public service portal is, is uh, esteemed is to be most visited public website in the world. Today, it is used by about 80% of Russian population. Um, on top of that, public service mobile app was granted uh, Best M Government Service Award, established by the United Arab Emirates Administration in the category uh, Accessible Government. Allow me, to, allow me also to highlight digital services for crisis management, which were promptly developed uh, in response uh, to the challenges uh, caused by the global pandemic. We have successfully deployed IT products that um, allow to stimulate transition to remote work and to increase its, its efficiency, as well, as well as to create conditions for quality online education uh, education processes. Um, the introduced digital solutions have also allowed to increase access to online employment, to develop communication services, to enhance diagnostic, health monitoring and vaccination systems, and to provide medical first aid uh, through advanced telemedicine. In general, uh, the development of Russia IT industry, industry is taking place in accordance with uh, the large-scale national program Digital Economy, which started in uh, 2019. Uh, the program covers advanced high-tech areas such as artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, 5G and quantum technologies. A special emphasis is put on cybersecurity and personal data protection. Recognizing the di digital technology industry as uh, one of the national priorities, uh, Russia has set of a course for creating unprecedented conditions for IT companies. In June of this year, uh, President Vladimir Putin announced uh, reduction in profit tax from 20% to 3% and in insurance premium rates to 7.6% uh, for IT companies. As a result, in the near future, Russia will boast having one of the most attractive jurisdictions for IT industry development in the whole world. And we are looking forward to inviting specialists and companies to cooperate with us and to work in Russia. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Your Excellency.
I really appreciate your intervention and you joining us uh, this afternoon uh, or tonight in Russia. Uh, let me remind all the participants uh, that we will have a few minutes for Q&A that will be left. Uh, we might be able to take one or two questions, so please uh, be sure to send questions uh, on you know, anything that comes on your mind that you would like the speakers to uh, comment on, okay? Um, the, after that, then I will turn it to uh, Mr. Ricardo Mina. He's a director at Entrum of UNDRR. Uh, um, and uh, Mr. Ricardo, let me ask you uh, specifically, how important in your opinion is bridging the digital divide to successful recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and building resiliency to other disasters? What are your thoughts? And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mina, and a uh, pleasure to be participating with uh, you and all the distinguished panelists. Let me start by, um, talking a bit about the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction and how uh, ICTs and early warning uh, have been considered in this framework that was adopted in 2015 by all member states. This is the global blueprint for reducing disaster losses and it recognizes the fundamental importance of telecommunication infrastructure to building resilience to disasters. In fact, one of the global targets of, of this uh, framework that was agreed uh, through an intergovernmental process is to substantially increase the availability and access to multi-hazard early warning systems and risk information and assessments. In addition, one of its four priorities for action is entirely dedicated to ensuring that governments are in a position to enhance disaster preparedness for effective response and to build back better. Of course, information and communication technologies are an important and integral component of multi-hazard early warning systems that manage and deliver alerts to those in affected areas and at wider at national or international level, which allows them to take action to mitigate the impact of hazards. And they have already played a crucial part in reducing mortality and injury from disasters, which are actually two of the other key global targets of the Sendai framework. The issue is that uh, based on ITU data, 97% of the world population now lives within reach of a mobile cellular signal and 93% within reach of a 3G or higher network. And these networks are an integral part of reducing disaster risk and saving lives. They are in fact the core technical support of early warning systems. However, let me briefly talk also about the digital divide. Because despite the ubiquity of mobile phone signals, the digital divide is still enormous. Based also on ITU data, 4.1 billion people now use the internet, and this is approximately 53% of the global population. However, an estimated 3.6 billion people remain offline with most of the unconnected living in the least developed countries. ICT has become one of the main drivers of economic growth and the eradication of poverty. And poverty is at the same time one of the main drivers of disaster risk. So the importance of ICTs to achieving both economic and social development explain the priority of bridging the digital divide. So, being disconnected or unable to use a computer means reduced capacity in general to access online learning, to participate in the modern economy, and to deepen one's understanding of many topics, including disaster risk, climate change, disease outbreaks, or even to access texts. People exposed to natural hazards in the poorest nations are generally more likely to die, suffer livelihood loss or displacement than in developed countries. Now, looking at it from the perspective of uh, the coronavirus, the COVID-19, there have been many positive experiences on the use of ICT in dealing with the COVID-19 sanitary emergency. And this emphasizes the need for this divide uh, to be uh, filled, this gap to be filled. For example, in, in Korea, ICTs facilitated the application of social distancing. They also facilitated the gathering of data key information such as the number of cases and tests performed, 
that was summarized provided as visualization data on the main page of the Korean Center for Disease Control website. But they also have facilitated COVID-19 treatment. For example, one Korean company used deep learning algorithm to predict the effect of a drug treatment and to propose candidate medicine to treat the coronavirus. So Switzerland, for example, place where I'm based, it has also uh, applied ICT technology to ensure that the population has a COVID-19 tracing app that has been uh, proving to be quite effective now that uh, after the first wave, you know, uh, close attention needs to be, to be given to any new cases. So let me conclude by providing three points. The reality is that while the coronavirus crisis has accelerated the update of, of digital solutions, it has also exposed to a huge gap between the haves and have nots when it comes to access to digital performance in platforms. Two, a key factor in success of national and local strategies for disaster risk reduction, many have been developed and it will be how these plans are able to exploit existing ICT infrastructure to educate and inform the general public on disaster risk reduction, not simply to dis disseminate early warning messages over, phone, uh, over mobile phone networks. And finally, for COVID-19 response or in recovery and other development challenges, the world will need a coordinated multilateral response to deal with the challenge of digitalization in order to make progress on building a more resilient and safer world, especially for the most vulnerable. So with this, I go back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciated your, uh, your comments. Uh, next uh, is Dr. Michael Lucan. She is the past president of IEEE Canada. Uh, Michael, great to, uh, to join you this morning again uh, after another panel. This is our second panel together, I think, uh, in Wissis. Um, Michael, I wanted to ask you, uh, from your vantage point or your perspective, what are your thoughts on building blocks that are needed to be in place um, you know, in order to provide affordable, resilient, and safe ICT services for all. What are your thoughts on, on that topic? Thank you very much, Mina. Um, your Excellencies, distinguished guests and attendees, I'm honored to be here today and speak on behalf of IEEE as a specific uh, activity partner of the WISIS Forum. As already mentioned today, ICTs, digital technologies, and associated services are recognized as a fundamental enabler of economic and social development, that is the growth of smart connected societies, and of course, to achieve the SDGs. Although great strides have been made, some showcased here today, a range of challenges remain, one of them being access. Let us consider the internet. Over 40% of the world's population does not have access to the internet. In some countries, less than 5%, for instance, in Eritrea, Madagascar, and Somalia. It's a true challenge to meet the goal of universal access by 2030. You asked about building blocks to realize affordable, resilient, and safe ICT services for all. There are many. They include technical, societal, governance, etc. building blocks. I'd like to focus on infrastructure, interoperability, and accessible services, applications, and content. Let's talk about infrastructure. By infrastructure, I mean not only reliable ICT infrastructure, but also ubiquitous power infrastructure as a prerequisite. We need electricity to run the ICT systems. Today, almost 1 billion people do not have access to electricity around the world. Without electricity there, we cannot operate a communications tower, a computer, a cell phone, many healthcare devices, and so on. We cannot rely, realize the deployment and use of effective, scalable information and communications technology infrastructure and benefit from related uh, services. The next building block is the accessibility of ICT services and applications. It is not helpful if people have energy to power a computer, 
but no way of understanding how to set it up because communication in the local language is weak or not available to special needs users. Similarly, there must be locally relevant content and or a locally needed service. Otherwise, even if connectivity infrastructure improves, ICT adoption will lag. Accessibility includes safety, safe use of the internet. Do not harm is essential. Systems need to be safe and secure to use. This includes device labeling, for example, to call out risks, safe operating instructions, data protection, and users' agency over their data. Standards help. IEEE continues to contribute in the technology and in the standards development. For example, in the network and information security, IoT, and data privacy process spaces. Let's talk about interoperability. All these ICT systems need to work together. They need to work across borders, boundaries, safely and reliably. We are a connected world. Global adoption of standards for ICT enables the interoperability of, of systems. IEEE's open standards building process where anyone from around the world can contribute is a process to work together, to collaborate, to create multi-stakeholder owned solutions. And we know that this type of solutions have a much better uh, rate of success for adoption. To recap, success depends on how well we work together to address, to implement the building blocks, power and ICT infrastructure deployment, including financing, interoperability, standards, accessibility to the user, training. We do need digital literacy, policy, policies and regulations to name a few. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mike. I really appreciated your comments. Uh, let me turn it now to our next speaker in line, Dr. Kwako Fusu Adarakwa, the Managing Director of the 25th Century Technology Limited of Ghana. Uh, Dr. Kwaku, uh, what are the issues uh, of smart city, uh, are issues of smart cities volatility real from your perspective? I think that kind of is, falls into um, um, the, the, the scope of the work that you do with, the, with your organization. Uh, so what are your thoughts on uh, how should we be developing, econ how should developing economies strategize to overcome you know, this tendency of, of volatility? Um, what are your thoughts? Thank you, uh, moderator Minahana. Thank you, sir. Uh, your Excellencies, distinguished uh, panelists, and uh, all participants, my regards, from Ghana. The smart city concept has now come to all of us as a major sustainable development concern. And indeed, countries develop and developing alike are faced with the agency to embrace it, to enable them digitally respond to the rapid global urbanization trends, which require responsive municipal services provision through the deployment of Internet of Things. Indeed, the ITU since 2015 has brought to bear the sustainable perspective the definition. Accordingly, goal 11 of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals expects of all countries to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Rightly so, the Smart uh, Africa Secretariat also is of the opinion that many countries, especially on the African continent, need to strategize to ensure that the deployment of technology towards the attainment of the smarter city agenda will be realized. The urgent need for developing economies to implement the smart city concept, therefore, requires that volatility issues associated are tackled with diligence and suitable as well as resilient responses found to them. In the first place, smart cities 
cannot be a copy and paste concept. This is because the differences in the underlying infrastructure and interoperability ecosystems of different cities would not permit the wholesale importation of smart city and products and products from one territory to the other. It is therefore required of developing economies by modeling their smart city concepts to have full understanding of their contingent situations ahead of designs and rollout. Indeed, this done, the global standards can then be benchmarked as appropriate. Again, there should be the avoidance of proliferation of infrastructure silos, which are not interoperable with systems. This challenge has become enormous in developing economies where the ICT infrastructure development is foreign company led. Indeed, emphasis should be placed on infrastructure sharing to prevent this silos development. The lack of robust broadband connectivity and uninterrupted access to internet coupled with the high cost of bandwidth, broadband bandwidth in many developed economies create volatility issues. This should always, there should always be the connectivity which should be top notch. Indeed, the advent of the COVID-19 has exposed this limitation. Uh, fortunately for us, the Alliance for Affordable Internet uh, has issued guidelines to this effect. The effect of broadband meaningful connectivity, which could be benchmarked. Indeed, and of major concern, the lack of inclusiveness in smart city policy formulation, culminating in inadequate consideration for gender parity and inclusiveness involving persons with disability considerations also constitute a major drawback that needs to be addressed. Because the high use of proprietary software as against homemade open software applications on the platforms of various uh, uh, apps also constitute hindrance to the developing economies as they are not able to expand infrastructure development because of the high cost of this proprietary software. Emphasis would therefore have to be shifted to capacity in open source development. And the major, major cons concern is the absence of regulations to back very beautiful data protection acts which have been formulated by many developing countries. The acts lack the regulations to ensure that the privacy of individuals, especially within this era of COVID-19, where many apps and solutions are being developed, are protected. Their yeah, privacy are protected. And so there's a need for urgent attention to be turned to the development of regulations to back the implementation of various data protection acts that have been promulgated in developing economies. Indeed, uh, it is worth it to note that the EU quite recently had a, a, a review of its regulations, which were formulated two years ago as a way of responding to the pressures of time. And so what should we also do to bridge this gap? What should government do to bridge this gap between the government facilitative role and the private sector contribution. We are postulating and we are in stating that the major role that government has to do is to facilitate the carrying out of technical, infrastructural, security, and legal gap analysis. The outcome will then be used by the private sector as tools for collaborating with government to develop various applications of course, taking into consideration the focus and leakages to the attainment of the sustainable development goals, which should always be the mindset of the collaboration between government and private sector. And this should lead to migration from high proportion of propriety to open source software usage in many developing economies. Also, it should lead to inculcating local content development into ICT growth and education. This should be so, so that from the community level, when the citizenry come into the city, they will not shy away from utilizing ICT applications 
which are to improve upon their lives. Again, there should be conscious effort by the developer companies to inculcate the training uh, in, the, uh, in the capacity building of the tertiary and secondary schools. Uh, in ICT past production, software development, data analytics, and algorithm development, so that contingently solutions can be found in situations that are local. Indeed, smart city development must not be seen as government driven. It should be government facilitated through the creation of the enabling environment. To this end, developing economies must promote partnership with the private sector to operate government and e-government platforms, financial services, banking switches in the fintech area, which is quite new, uh, is another area that government can provide the enabling environment for the private sector to also uh, come in. And most importantly, the development of the collaboration between government and the private sector to lead to the development of applications which should not be dummies. They should be said that everybody should be able to apply, should be able to lead without much literature, without much reference, if we want actually to have a sustainable smart development. And these apps should be available on almost all systems and um, interfaces. If I may have to conclude, the 21st century technology that um, I serve has positioned itself as um, a strategy development uh, 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 entity to work towards the attainment of the necessary collaboration that needs to be established between governments and the private sector. To this end, the facilitation by governments of shared and co-created cities that is participatory enough to involve the citizenry and other shareholders, including the private sector, in all aspects of the urban life is thus inevitable. And if I may end, I may have to thank the ITU for giving us the opportunity to share our thoughts. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kwaku, uh, for your uh, for your notes. Very, very informative. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, last but not least, and I will, you know, before uh, we go ahead to Ms. Greeny, uh, just uh, from a time perspective, we have eight minutes left to the panel. Uh, so if anyone really thinks of the last question or if there are no Q&A from the audience, we will just go to concluding remarks from our esteemed speakers. So uh, Ms. Asma Brini, uh, representing Woman Vi, uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, really excited to hear your thoughts. Let me ask you a point of question, um, a little bit about Woman Vi. Uh, can you tell us a little more about the project, the beneficiaries, what are the added values, does the business for the the Wizards Forum bring to you? Uh, what are your uh, thoughts? And just tell us more a little about your, um, your organization. Thank you very much, uh, Mina. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks so much to the Wisest Process organizer. It has been a great pleasure uh, and honor to again participate this year. I'm here today as one of the co-founders of Women Vi as an international NGO, incorporated two years ago and headquartered in Paris, France, tailored to support innovative projects in environment and high tech led by women, supported by women and men. We offer programs to girls and women in STEM, right from the age of eight and all along uh, their career path. Together with our partners, Swiss Engineering, the y e YFEO and other private SMEs active in ICTs, including AB Shore, I'm the CEO of, we did moderate more, uh, uh, we did moderate and speak at three work workshops digital adaptation, how to develop a system that is cost effective and deliver sustainability, uh, waste and water data solutions for reducing environment impact, women engineers and technicians contributing to the ICTs related SDGs and WISIS objectives. 
Ladies and gentlemen, women and men, engineers and scientists, together led technological programs and projects around the world. Innovation, strategic planning, cooperation and modernization of the infrastructure are key success factors for achieving SDGs and why these action lines. We have been present all along these weeks to help enrich uh, the debate and bring concrete examples shown on the international scene, so to share practices and experiences. We would like to emphasize on the outcomes of the why this process from our perspective and give our conclusion by first, raising visibility of women all along the WISIS process, proving we have great competencies in STEM, leadership, leadership and management. Second, demonstrating the importance of the use of all modern technologies, in particular ICT, to promote women's empowerment. Three, working on an artificial intelligence regulation for a better gender equality, artificial intelligence tools and system that will contribute further to a more sustainable and inclusive growth. Fourth, offering your young generation opportunities to innovate and start off the ICT based SMEs, especially our women entrepreneurs working in and with STEM. Fifth, increasing possibilities for international cooperation among organizations for women in STEM. We, engineers, technicians, and scientists in ICTs, women and men together, declare that the YZ 2020 has helped develop active collaboration across our global platform and provide expertise for a more efficient sustainable development and we shall not stop here of course as we wish to call on governments on policy makers to implement gender mainstreaming in icts and environment and we women vi and swiss engineering are ready to partner with you in uh, the two key strategic areas, an industry uh, 4.0 and digital transformation of our societies through innovation, role of women and men engineers and scientists in the 21st century. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Brini. Uh, it seems that we are making it um, pretty close on time. So we are, you know, we have done a fantastic job getting in you know, all the remarks and all the interventions of all the fantastic speakers. Uh, Your Excellencies, our esteemed uh, panelists, uh, it's been my honor to uh, to moderate this high policy, uh, high level policy discussion. Thank you very much for all your interventions and, and remarks. Uh, it's been very illuminating to, you know, to be part on, you know, be part of that. And thank you for the, for the honor, for the opportunity for IEEE to be moderating that. Um, and uh, of course, thank you very much to the ITU and the fantastic team who have put together this panel and this schedule uh, and that platform for all of us to speak together. So the last thing that I will uh, ask everyone to uh, perhaps if they are, uh, if, they, if, they would, if they would do that, please, uh, we'll just do a group photo that will be taking on Zoom. So if everyone is, uh, um, you know, is willing to look at that camera and just smile for three seconds, we'll take that group photo and then we'll kick it off to the partner's uh, video. And that will be the conclusion. There are no questions, by the way, from the floor. So it seems that we've had uh, everything covered here. So uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead for the group photo. Please uh, look into your cameras, turn on your videos and smile. Thank you very much. Thank you very much all. Uh, it's been a distinct pleasure and an honor uh, to have you, your excellencies and everyone. Um, I think that will be all. Uh, I wish you all a pleasant day and uh, we'll start the partner video. Thank you all and uh, we'll talk to you hopefully soon again.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. This is a moment to uh, thank our partners, Platinum Partner, UAE, Gold Plus Partner, Saudi Arabia, Japan, Switzerland, IEEE, Contributing Partner, Rumra, Rwanda, ICANN, Internet Society, University of Geneva, Shingwa Initiative, Global Coalition on Aging, and IFIP. Without their support, the VISIS Forum would not have been possible in this virtual format. So thank you very much to all our partners. Thank you, Gitanjali, and thank you, everyone. All the best. Cheers.